Wow, what an unseasonably warm weather today and this whole weekend. Uh, it doesn't feel like it's the end of October. And I feel like uh, our kids in ho at Halloween will be walking around in shorts. Um, I'm so glad you have decided to attend this uh, conference rather than sunbathing outside. So thank you for joining us. It is the 31st annual Hamuzu Colloquium. And we uh, this year, the topic is competing voices, protests and political activism in Korea. For those who don't know much about HMS Colloquium, Hamuzu uh, is a renowned Korean writer and her heart for the humanities, arts and social sciences uh, really just led us to this point here where uh, her two children who are sitting right here, Youngi Kim Reno and Hogi Kim have established this forum for scholars to get together and share ideas and learn about uh, the humanities, arts and social sciences. So we are indebted to uh, Yonggi and Hogi for establishing this long running 31st annual uh, colloquium. Today, I will be your host and moderator, Emmanuel Kim. <laughs> I am the Korea Foundation, Kim Murnod, Associate Professor of Korean Literature and Culture Studies in the Department of East Asian Languages and Literatures at the GW, <laughs> at the George Washington University. Uh, I will, first of all, I would like to open up um, welcoming remarks and introduce you to our two, our three speakers. Uh, first is my dean, Dean Paul Walbeck, uh, dean of the Columbia College of Arts and Sciences here at the George Washington University. Paul. Well, thank, thank you all. It's great to be here with you today. Thank you, Emmanuel, for the introduction. As Dean of GW's Columbian College of Arts and Sciences, I want to welcome each and every one of you to the 31st HMS Colloquium in Korean Humanities. So this colloquium represents one of the longest running interdisciplinary forum academic discussions at the university. Its distinctive focus on Korean arts, literature, history, language, philosophy, and religious systems is crucial to advancing cross-cultural engagement. This year's examination of the shifting practices of protest cultures in Korea is particularly prescient considering what's going on in the world today. Among our distinguished guests is Young Ki Kim Reno, GW Professor Emeritus of Korean Language and Culture and international affairs. Dr. Kim Renault was instrumental in founding the colloquium in establishing this event as a rigorous academic pursuit of excellence in the humanities, arts, and social sciences. Inviting scholars from all over the world to better understand Korea within the global and transnational context. So thank you, Dr. Kim Renault, for your commitment to the success of this colloquium. And thank you all for being here today on this beautiful day where you could be outside sunbathing or doing other fun activities in, in the warm weather. So let me turn it back over to uh, Dr. Kim. Next is Nick Vonortas, Associate Dean of Research Initiatives here at the Elliott School of International Studies at the George Washington University. Nick. Thank you. Thank you, Paul. Thank you. Thank you, Jesus. Um, thank you for the invitation to be here. I want to welcome everyone uh, at the Elliott School of International Affairs, um, the GWICS, the uh, George Washington Institute for Korean Studies, is one of our most active uh, institutes in, in the uh, Elliott School. And um, the events that I have participated until now, at least, they are stellar. Of course, I know I know very little about protests, uh, other than the protests that I've done myself when I was young, uh, because I grew up in a country which which, and I entered a university, a public university in that country that had just gotten rid of a Honda. Um, and and as you understand, in that university in the mid seventies, uh, everything was boiling. Um, uh, so, so I have demonstrated a lot myself, but uh, other than that, uh, I don't know much about the Korean demonstrations. However, 
I love Korea. And this Sunday, this Sunday, I'm going to Korea um, the day after tomorrow. So uh, there is a big conference of the International Association for Science Parks um, uh, celebrating Inopolis, actually the 50 years of Inopolis. And I will be in Dedok uh, for, the, for, the, for the week. So um, my background, as you understand, is science and technology policy. Um, so I came out of that institute here in, uh, in, uh, at uh, the Elliott School. And uh, uh, I want to say that these this problems with the uh, mic is uh, very, very typical. The one, thing, one thing I say to my students, Every time we deal with information technology, right? Information technology is everywhere. Um, uh, is this information technology today, if you pay attention, is at such an embryonic stage as the automobile industry was with the T model of Ford. I mean, all this back and forth and all this, uh, uh, this, this is ridiculous that we have to do this, right? We should say one word and things should operate. I mean, that's it. I mean, no, 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 no. I mean, that's a technology, right? And so without further ado, I will, I, 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 I want to congratulate you for, for putting this together, having it for 31 years. Oh my God. <laughs> um, and um, I hope everything goes well. Thank you for coming to the Elliott School. Thank you. Thank you, Dean Vornortas. Uh, you're going to Korea. If you go to Korea today, there's still protests. Um, and uh, hey, this could be one. This could be you. This, <laughs> you could be right there in the crowd. I hope you enjoy Korea. Uh, finally, we have Hogi Kim, the chairman of the Han Musuk Foundation in Korea. He flew all the way from Korea. Please welcome him. Ladies and gent gentlemen, it is an honor and pleasure for me to speak to this distinguished audience at the great George Washington University, right in the middle of the beautiful capital of the United States. Theme of the 31st Hanmus Colloquium meeting under the title of Competing Voices, Protests and Political Activ Activism in Korea is timely, not only for the for the current highly divisive society of Korea today, but also in many other places as well. Mm -hmm. Last time I attended the Han Musu Colloquium in the Korean Humanities was in uh, 2018, five years ago. The 26th Colloquium commemorating the 100th birthday of Han, Han Musu met under the theme of emotion, culture, and subjectivity in Korea. And in my brief remark, I quoted the famous motto of American founding fathers, a pluribus unum, or out of many, one. And the teaching of Confucius, her pourtant, or different but not confrontational. Han Musuk in a life and literature sought for harmony among human beings and the ultimate redemption of mankind. The Han Musuk Lokim upholds her spirit and encourages dialogue among different people and cult cultures. I'm told that the Han Musuk Lokim had GW is one of the oldest, if not the oldest, academic forums in the world focusing on the Korean humanities. The past 30 excellent meetings, which, which were all recorded, are tes testimonials to its sustaining value and influence on not only the humanities studies, but also on all other fields in which human nature and human institu institutions interact. The co colloquium is especially notable in that most unusually it honors a woman and a Korean woman at that, who was a writer, 
not a business, businessman or a, a political figure. Mm. I look forward to learning a lot from our distinguished speakers to, today. I expect to be fascinated to hear different perspectives on Korean society today. The Hamus Colloquium will allow us to become wiser through a true dialogue and genuine interest in each other's works to eventually contribute to making this world more rational and more peaceful. I would like, I would like to express my sincere gratitude to Professor Emmanuel Kim, the main, main convener of this year's colloquium, and all the other faculty, staff, and students who gave generous, generously given their time and efforts to make this event a success. Finally, I join you all in wishing, wishing an enjoyable and fruitful colloquium. Thank, thank you. Thank you very much, Chairman Kim. All right, now we will get into our uh, colloquium and I will introduce the first session. We'll take a break and then we'll uh, continue with the second session and we'll have a general Q&A at the end. Uh, so if you have any questions, just prepare yourself and uh, ask at the end. Uh, the first session, I will call up uh, and introduce uh, the speakers and the discussant. The first one is Yoon Kyung Lee, a professor of sociology at the University of Toronto. Uh, she is also the director of the Center of the Study of Korea in, at the same institution. And she is a political sociologist specializing in labor politics, social movements, democracy, and political economy of neoliberalism with a regional focus on East Asia. The second speaker is Jennifer Jie Chun. Uh, she's an associate professor of Asian American studies and labor studies at the University of California, Los Angeles. She is also chair of the International Development Studies Program at the International Institute and associate director of the Institute for Research on Labor and Employment at UCLA. And then our discussant is our very own Professor Celeste Arrington, a Korea Foundation Associate Professor of Political Science and International Affairs at the George Washington University. If uh, hello, everyone. Uh, I'm Yoon Kyung Lee, and thank you so much for coming to this uh, colloquium. Uh, before I begin, I'd like to thank Professor Emmanuel Kim, Professor Chi Kim, and the Hamusuk Foundation, uh, the Department of East Asian Languages and Literature and uh, GWIAS, George Washington Institute for Korean Studies, uh, and uh, the George Washington University uh, for organizing and inviting me to this uh, colloquium. I also want to thank um, uh, Young Soo Chang and uh, Sean Dolan, who provided all the uh, logistic help and other support to make this kind of event uh, possible. I greatly appreciate the opportunity to talk about my research on politics and political activism, without which Korean society and politics would not be fully understood. Today, I'll begin with a brief discussion of several waves of protest movements that have shaped and altered the course of national politics in South Korea and the role of social movements for Korean democracy. Based on my book, they came out from the University of Hawaii Press uh, last year. In the second half of my talk, I will speak about some distinctive variations in protest repertoires across different sectoral movements and uh, focus on the emergence of extreme protests by labor activists and what these extreme repertoires signify about Korean democracy and capitalism. Korean democracy is unthinkable without vocal and progressive social movements that have pushed the wheels of democratization over the last several decades. People power has generated many political breakthroughs in the, national, in the nation as Korean citizens mobilized in the streets in the hundreds of thousands and even in several millions to bring down dictatorial regimes in 1960 in 1980, and finally in 1987, as you see in the um, left side uh, uh, picture, 
and to demand the expansion of democratic rights and workers' rights throughout the 90s to warn political parties by blacklisting unsuitable candidates in 2000 and 2004 to critique unequal relations with the US in 2002 and 2008, to reinstate the unjustly impeached president, Noh Mui Hyun, in 2004, and to actually impeach the incumbent, the then incumbent president, Park Geun Hye, for violating constitutional rule in 2017, as you see on the right side picture. And this table shows a snapshot of some of the largest waves of protest movements since 1987, which generated real consequences in the form of political arena. The Korean citizens are viewed as being really good at protesting <laughs> and participatory Democrats who experience greater political efficacy when they participate in direct action than in institutional politics, such as elections. Korean politics is made by a strong state and contentious society, scholars define, advancing via the direct conflict between the state and powerful pro-democracy movements, which are well institutionalized but defiant and even overtaking the function of political parties from time to time. Here, I'd like to preface that Korean social movements are not homogeneous, but diverse and diversifying in terms of their scope of advocacy and organizational size, driven by political or identity or everyday politics uh, goals, engaging in direct action or community building activities, pursuing autonomous status or institutional inclusion, and practicing very variegated protest repertoires. In my study of social movements, I focused on the national level, well-established large SMOs who have played a critical role for mobilizing street protest and creating impact on institutional politics. Since democratic transition in 1987, activists from the CHEA, dissident groups, and student movements have been joined by a larger number of academics and professionals with diverse expertise to form various civic organizations. These SMOs are characterized by three bigs. They are large in the size of the organization, large in the scope of advocacy areas, and large in activity funds that are generated on their own. And the active participation of full-time activists called Sangun Hartunga in Korean and professionals enabled the SMO's agenda setting and policy crafting capacity. Another important aspect of Korean SMOs is forming national umbrella networks for horizontal solidarity through which nationwide advocacy and protests are organized. In my book, I conceptualize this as the national solidarity infrastructure involving national level coordination, mobilization, and policy advocacy, which effectuate critical interventions in national politics. And this table shows some of the most prominent uh, social movement organizations. And as you can see from their names, uh, they are not just focused on a specific issue, but concerned about national and systemic agenda. And they are organized nationally with headquarters in Seoul, the capital city, and local branches in other major regional locations. So whenever um, a social or political uh, issue arises, Social movement organizations quickly form a response committee. And as Bang Ne Gun, a lifelong um, activist, boasts, we Korean SMOs can put together a national response committee in less than a week. And since this uh, interview took place you know, several years ago, now with all the you know, social media and technology, maybe they could do this within a day or less. And the organizations such as the People's Solidarity for Participatory Democracy, Citizens Coalition for Economic Justice, Korea Confederation of Trade Unions, uh, Korean Women's Associations United, Korea Federation of Environmental Movements, and Green Korea all have a significant number of full-time activists, Hangun Hartunga, as you see in the number in the parentheses, compared to the number of full-time staff in one of the you know, major political parties in South Korea, the Democratic Party. So if you combine all the number of full-time staff, much greater. So you, you can see the um, weight of um, uh, influence they can make. And they play, these organizations play the role of nodal organizations 
through everyday networking with each other and by bringing together national and local groups. Yes, social movements are a living creature and the conditions have shifted since the time I conducted my research around um, up until uh, 2017. Today, we live in an era of democratic reversals and erosions and Korean democracy is not an exception in this global trend as we saw during the Park Geun-hye government previously and now on the president Yoon Sung-yeol, a career prosecutor and a complete novice in formal politics. Social movements and civil society can serve as a meaningful counterforce when democracy faces threats and challenges. But the democracy generation that has buttressed Korean democracy is uh, aging and getting weak, literally and sociopolitically. Former democracy activists are now in their 60s and over and the inflow of young activists has been in short supply. I mean, to the big organizations that I've uh, been uh, describing previously. The democracy generation has also been in facing increasing criticism from the younger generation for their degenerating visions and practices that are built upon old masculine political grammar instead of learning from and building solidarity with new feminist, queer, disability, and climate just movements. Another concern comes from a small and local civil society outside the realm of my focus on large um, civic groups like the you know, People's Solidarity for Participatory Democracy. These small organizations often rely on public projects funded by local governments or central governments, and as such, lose the character of political independence and contentious protesting. And these developments become more worrisome uh, in the context of increasingly, increasingly well-organized far-right counter movements called Taegeukgi protests that challenge the, ba the basic tenets of democratic diversity and inclusion. So if you go to Korea now, uh, the main squares uh, in downtown uh, Seoul will be divided by these uh, pro-democracy, uh, progressive social movements organizing protests and these far-right counter-movements um, uh, protest uh, taking place uh, next to each other. As I noted earlier, Korean social movements are diverse and their protest repertoires are uh, understood as, uh, quote, the limited, familiar, historically created areas of claim-making performances, unquote, by Charles Tilly, are divergent. In post-authoritarian Korea, mass street demonstrations, rallies, and marches which often violently clashed with state authorities, have been replaced by peaceful and festival, uh, festive and light protests that enable greater participation of ordinary citizens. Other non-belligerent forms of protests were also invented, such as using sticky notes, i.e. post-its, in symbolic places like the Gangnam Station after femicide in 2016, and the Kui station where a 19 year old precarious worker died the same year, or uh, individual wearing a yellow ribbon or posting opinion posters or wallpapers in public spa spaces. And of course, in hashtags in social media spheres for a variety of social causes. In this context, a picture of Che An Yu, uh, that you see on this side, uh, the union leader of the shipbuilding subcontract workers who locked himself in an iron cage of one cubic meters, which he welded from inside, captivated my attention and pushed me to wonder about the specific form of labor resistance uh, in Korea. The self lock in uh, lasted for 30 days during uh, the 2022 strike that demanded a wage increase just to meet the inflation rate against the drop of real wages since 2016. The banner he read, uh, he held, read, we can't live like this, can we? And another one by his co-worker outside the cage, so not in this picture, I uh, read, there is a human being here. 여기 사람이 있습니다. So why do labor activists, not other social movement actors, pervasively choose to engage in this form of extreme protest? How can we explain the routinized practices of extreme repertoires by labor protesters in times of liberal democracy and material affluence in Korea. 
I define extreme repertoires as a form of protest performed individually or by a large number of protesters accompanying a high level of self-imposed danger and pain while not harming others and stage for collective cause beyond a personal grievance. Extreme repertoires include uh, several um, uh, protest forms, such as uh, hunger strike, long-term pro uh, long protest camps, like in this picture, sky protest, uh, protest by occupying high altitude structures, like you see uh, in uh, the right side picture there, uh, and uh, self-lock-ins, like the case that uh, I showed you in the previous slide, and Sambo Ilbe wa Uchetuji March, uh, which is uh, the protesters make three steps and then uh, bow down to the ground to touch five parts of their body on the ground and repeat the, the you know, three bows and uh, uh, touching the ground uh, until they reach the um, uh, targeted destination. And even uh, protest suicides, which are adopted concurrently in sequence or in cycle. And this figure, um, is um, from my data collection on uh, various uh, protest repertoire forms, uh, shows that while worker street protests and rallies in the blue color uh, continue, the growing frequency of sit-ins, uh, including sky protests uh, in the purple color, as you can see, and self-inflicting protests in light blue color is, clear, uh, uh, is increasing uh, um, in recent years. And I interpret this in the context of ever neoliberalizing Korean capitalism and labor markets under which workers experience a serious extent of stratification and precarity without having proper organizational channels to address and resolve their grievances. The labor market has been divided between the few regular workers and the majority of non-regular workers. And discrimination between status groups is significant in terms of wages, working conditions, and social protection. Furthermore, Korean workers today are often subjected to runaway capital, mass layoffs, plant closures, abrupt termination of non-regular workers' contract, and denial of labor sta uh, employment status or labor rights. The government, in alliance with corporations and mass media, takes more aggressive measures towards organized labor than other social movements by portraying labor unions as iron balls, corrupt and violent groups, by judging labor strikes as unlawful act, and by employing new tactics by um, uh, tactics of labor repression, such as damage compensation lawsuits, the deployment of commercial security forces, and criminalization of union activities with the arrest and imprisonment of union leaders. And the decline of full-time workers means labor's associational power is weakened, and the rise of non-regular workers implies that they easily lose access to their workplace as the ground for collective action. Thus, um, their uh, protest repertoires by Korean workers are an expression of collective identity, that is, their acute sense of collective injustice experienced within the relationship of power vis-a-vis -vis the state and corporations. As workers perceive the government less democratic to labor union than uh, other contentious groups and experience the impossibility of redress through collective bargaining or formal political processes, labor activists are driven to protest repertoires that enable labor's cause audible and visible through dramatic visualization of their pain, duress, and precarity in Korean society. In conclusion, democracy is harsh to workers as the government's capacity, openness, and democratic inclusion are not equally applied to all social contenders. The emergence of extreme protest repertoires by Korean workers is a manifestation of their precarity and repression experienced in their interaction with democratic state authorities and world-leading corporations. Workers who encounter the blunt consequences of the neoliberal economy and the failure of political redress push their bodily harm to the extreme by inflicting the danger and pain onto themselves as a way of having their dire circumstances known and appealing for public support and solidarity. 
Democracy in Korea, in short, is severely classed as much as it is gendered and anti-diversity. Thank you. Thank you. Um, so today I'll be talking about the everyday life of protest. Before I get into the study of why protest politics in Korea must necessarily foreground questions of care, reflexivity, and solidarity, I want to actually begin at another point of departure, and that is failure. So failure is pretty much an unpopular subject among social movement scholars, says political sociologist Kim Voss. Quote, like death and taxes at social gatherings, it is a topic that many of us avoid. Yet failure, as well as death, are topics that can no longer be avoided when it comes to studying Korean labor protest, uh, as Yoon Kyung Lee um, has already talked about. And especially protests led by Pi Chung Yujik or precarious workers, is, which is the term I'm going to be used to characterize this group of workers. So when I first began following precarious workers um, in the late 1990s and early 2000s, I really chronicled a story of innovation and dynamism, albeit on the margins of organized labor, and that was in my first book. Yet it was becoming increasingly clear in the early 2010s that precarious workers were fighting losing battles. Uh, and during a casual conversation with one labor activist that I connected with in the summer of 2014, she said, quote, the struggle of, struggles of Pijang Yujik workers are bound to fail, which surprised me at the time because there were so many protests being waged by precarious workers that very summer. So the paradox, uh, this paradox is at the heart of the book uh, that we've been writing for the past seven years. Why, in the face of misrecognition, abjection, and failure, do protesters continue to protest and in even more desperate registers? Since, um, since the mid-2000s, the workers that we have followed, many of whom are women who face intense gender discrimination and are consistently decide, uh, denied their basic labor rights and precarious jobs, have spearheaded grueling battles that last, that last months and sometimes years with no end in sight. So their labor disputes usually begin with a familiar pattern. They form a union, they demand collective bargaining, yet given the rampant climate of anti-unionism and uh, the lack of institutional uh, protections that many precarious workers, as well as workers uh, more generally face, um, they experience the denial of the quote, right to have rights in the words of Hannah Arendt. Not only are they denied, um, uh, deprived of the institutional basis of social recognition and political belonging, but they are confronted with a state of abjection, a word that quote, in everyday use signals debasement and extreme societal rejection. So in response, aggrieved workers who essentially refuse to submit, refuse to uh, uh, you know, give up their struggle for even the most basic labor demands, um, persist. Uh, and they persist by turning to protest forms that stretch our sense of time and space. Uh, and Yoon Kyung has already talked about this. So this is the KTX uh, crew attendance branch workers uh, union, uh, Sung Muan. They uh, waged the longest uh, running uh, struggle to date, 4,526 days uh, for over 12 years. Um, and they fought so hard and staged so many protest actions, including hunger strikes, head shavings, high altitude occupations, sit-ins and tent encampments, that a journalist once uh, uh, quipped that there was no place that they had not at least once occupied. Similarly, uh, Kiryu Electronics workers uh, waged a 1,895 day long fight, which ended in defeat. Uh, and to mark the official end, uh, two union leaders uh, held, led a five day long, 15 kilometer Oche Tuji uh, procession, a really slow moving, grueling uh, march performed in December of 2014 across the snow and soot covered streets of Seoul. So these are just two examples that we profile in our book against abandonment, refusal and solidarity in South Korean protest. The book draws upon long-term ethnographic research that we've conducted on union struggles led by precarious women workers as really part of a broader protest repertoire of labor and social movements since the mid 2000s. Uh, written with Juhi Judy Han, Against Abandonment examines the utility 
and futility of protest in challenging precarity as a life-depriving system under globalized neoliberal capitalism. A crucial stage of the field work was conducted over 12 month period, September 2016 to 2017, which we did not plan this, occurred quite unexpectedly with the largest and most widely heralded protest events in Korean, contemporary uh, Korean history, the candlelight protests. So I can talk more about our methods uh, in the Q&A if you'd like, but a point I wanna emphasize is that uh, as um, uh, Korean American feminist researchers, who really see ourselves as part of a, a diasporic commu uh, political communities that have long invested in transnational exchange and solidarity with progressive Korean movements. Our research was explicitly root uh, rooted in what um, Macarena Gomez Berres calls a quote, decolonial methodology. Um, a paradigm that moves beyond just, you know, quote, mere resistance and instead reveals the emancipatory potential of quote, less perceivable worlds, life forms and the organization of relations with them in the context of these ex very extractive geographies of neoliberal capitalism. So given my limited time, I only wanna share a few of the brief claims of our book, um, just to provide some broader context about why and how we theorize the significance of care, reflexivity, and solidarity in movements that feel really overdetermined by failure. Uh, and first is that social movements are not just about what movements do or claim to do to achieve their goals. Crucially, we see movements as about how movements move, both the protesters themselves and the people who witness and support their struggles. Second, we see the structure of precarity as one that also produces these structures of feelings, but these structures of feelings have outcomes that far exceed a single case or set of events. These structures are feeling are simultaneously life depriving as well as life affirming, which we'll, I'll talk about um, for the remainder of the talk. And they evoke a sense of embodied connectedness that uh, extends across space and time. Third, we see protest repertoires, especially the repeated performance of certain protest acts by different actors for different reasons as generating solidarity as affect in motion, binding people and worlds together across uh, in, through the doing and feeling of protest. And then fourth, we argue that protest repertoires are really uh, fueled or powered by a labor of refusal. And this labor of refusal has these two anchors. One is that it builds caring infrastructures that really sustain these seemingly losing battles, but they also engage in placemaking, um, the active making and remaking of place that we see uh, decisively changes social and material relations. Okay, now, so now I will turn to care and why care matters for protest. So the study of care has long been neglected uh, in labor and social movement inquiry. And this is largely due to the fact that care itself is a form of unpaid and devalued reproductive labor that is also neglected as essential care work, uh, care work uh, mostly because of the fact that it's performed by women. So feminist scholars such as political scientist Joan Toronto uh, have called for the need to theorize care as crucial to the reproduction of everyday life and our futures. And to do this, she develops a framework for the feminist ethics of care that views care as comprising of all the activities involved in keeping life going. And for our purposes, we see care work as all the activities involved in keeping the life of a protest going. Uh, Toronto outlines four aspects of care in her capacious framework. Uh, and we add a fifth aspect, uh, and that is caring infrastructure. Uh, and you know, this kind of multi-scalar, multi-faceted conception of care really um, uh, uh, acknowledges all of the work that is involved in, um, you know, how do you support protesters who face mounting opposition, dwindling participation, and repeated backlash and set setbacks. So the social movements literature uh, might subsume, subsume caring infrastructure into a framework of social movement infrastructures, which sociologist Albert Malucci views as part of the quote unquote hidden structures and latent networks that exist in the substratum of everyday life during quote transient periods of mobilization. But this not only privileges 
uh, mass mobilization as the sort of um, don't, like the, the the you know the the, the valued or privileged uh, form of social movement um, action. Um, but it also misunderstands why infrastructure and invisibility are important. According to anthropologist Brian Lar Larkin, quote, Invi invisibility is certain, certainly one aspect of infrastructure, but it is only one and at the extreme edge of a range of visibilities that move from unseen to grand spectacles and everything in between, end quote. Between visibility and invisibility are in-between processes of becoming visible and also becoming invisible. So in other words, we need to recognize this, uh, quote, peculiar ontology that Larkin says uh, makes infrastructure both, quote unquote, things and relations between things or what uh, Abdul Malik Simone calls, quote, people as infrastructure, or what Lauren uh, Berlant calls infrastructure as the, quote, life world of structure. So we see these infrastructural dynamics at play uh, during our interview with Sister Maria, who is one of the most important activist organizers in religious circles supporting labor and social movements. And we've interacted with Sister Maria at so many different protest events. And when we sat down for our first formal interview in August 2017, one of the first things she told us was, quote, you know, she was kind of laughing because she ran into these other nuns on the way and they were like, oh, did you organize this? Like your smell was all over it. And so that really kind of shaped the beginning of our interview. And she continued to tell us, quote, people have no idea I, that I was the organizer for the prayer solidarity protests for laid off Hangyong Motors workers. The police didn't know either. I try not to be noticed as much as possible. And she's laughing and we're laughing. She's even in Miyang, nobody knew that I was the one organizing things. I didn't talk about it. And so for background, the prayer solidarity protests for laid off Sangyong Motors workers occurred during the summer of 2013 outside the Tianmen gates of Togsu Palace. Um, and between April and, 19, uh, April and November of 2013, Sister Maria really took the lead in organizing these daily masses to publicly and collectively mourn a death toll that would reach 28 workers. Um, and this was after a brutal crackdown of a 77-day uh, factory occupation in, in Pyeongtaek in 2009, as well as ongoing retaliation because some of these workers refused to just simply go back to work and end their demands for um, job reinstatement. And as the lead coordinator for this effort, Sister Maria planned programs, she ensured a, ensured a steady flow of participants to the daily masses, but she also faced daily intimidation and harassment from police. And so to deal with the police, Sister Maria talked about the tactic of hiding in plain sight, explaining, quote, we have a few rules, like never give them your real name. Just tell the police your name is Maria. And then she laughs, we laughs, and there's so many people from the convent order and we all wear the same habits. The police can't tell who is who, they think we all look the same. And so Sister Maria's pseudonym actually comes from Sister Maria herself during the course of this interview. Uh, Sister Maria is an important figure in supporting protest actors across different movements uh, engaged in similar repertoires of protest. And the fight in Midyang, uh, which was led by grandmothers, was also grueling. Uh, what began in 2005 as a local dispute against the Korea Electric Power Corporation and their plans to displace mostly elderly residents uh, through the construction of 52 high voltage transmission towers transecting farming communities in the mountain south, uh, mountainous southeast uh, uh, region of the country really morphed into this decade-long battle uh, that elicited broad-based solidarity from environmental, anti-nuclear, and religious activists from around the country, including Sister Maria. So what is significant about Sister Maria is the essential forms of care that she provides to fortify the capacity of protesters to withstand conflict, hardship, pain, suffering, ambivalence, disappointment, and so on, uh, police repression. Um, and in the chapter of our book that deals with um, you know, um, uh, caring infrastructures, we discuss how Sister Maria engages in almost all the aspects of care work uh, that Joan Tronto outlines. And to briefly summarize, 
you know, she begins by caring about. So her own personal journey um, when she joined Apostolic Life in the early 1990s was actually traveling to and from the subway uh, uh, from Incheon to Myeongdong Cathedral. And she says at the time, it was a long ride, not like it is now. Um, but she started to stay later and later at Myeongdong Cathedral because of all the protests were happening. And so this first dimension of caring about, which is an essential form of what it means to um, have a feminist ethics of care, really was also part of the um, transportation infrastructure. Um, her care work became more involved when she began actively caring for people involved in different uh, protest movements. And caring for per Toronto is about the work of directing and guiding care more than the actual manual work of doing care. For example, if you have parents who hire child care workers or uh, elder care workers, um, and so what Sister Maria really did was she tried to really change the reorganize uh, the priorities of the Catholic Church itself, form small groups, then establish an official division. And she said, actually, um, the nuns are much more powerful in the Roman Catholic Church organization when it comes to progressive uh, solidarity causes uh, than the priests. And then, of course, you know, um, issuing formal solidarity statements and organizing solidarity actions like the prayer uh, protests are part of caring for. Sister Maria is also involved in direct caregiving, uh, including the nitty gritty work of providing for protesters in need, mutual aid, emotional support to Tang Saja or the people most protesters most effective, as well as protective accompaniment. And that was really the main form of care work they did in Midyang. And Sister Maria recalls waking up before dawn every morning as she and other nuns made their way up to the mountains in Midyang to stand in solidarity with Midyang uh, grandmothers on the mountaintops, especially then when they were facing such daily um, and hostile um, counter attacks. Playing a supportive role, however, sometimes creates awkward situations. And so one example of this is the Chujam, a pop-up fundraising event where snacks and drinks are sold and alcohol. And we asked, you know, uh, Sister Maria, somehow it seems odd to picture a nun organizing or going to a Chujam because this is really regularly among the um, activities that she does. And she said, I know some won't do it, but I do. Nuns do feel burdened by the selling of alcohol. So we don't participate. We go early and we help with preparations and then we leave. People like me, we don't mind putting on an apron and serving people. We know how to sell a lot of food and raise money. And then she, you know, she continues to say, we just know how to get work done. So I want to also talk about Sister Maria's pragmatic approach because she shows that she's also deeply invested in performing the kind of care work that is concrete and material. It's not just spiritual guidance or religious solidarity or sort of lending the dignity or the respectability politics uh, of um, uh, religious leaders. It's also about you know, getting your hands dirty and really being there. And that's something we heard repeatedly through all of our uh, interviews with workers and protest actors is just the tremendous importance of being there and standing by protesters' side. Um, I want to turn to now the dilemmas of caregiving uh, and care receiving, which are two other components of the feminist ethics of care, according to Tronto. Um, and, you know, what's significant about um, caregiving and care um, receiving is that it reveals more power laden and unequal dynamics when it comes to care. And, you know, so how do you deal with these unequal dynamics within the social movement? Well, the Korean social movements had not been good at this in the 1980s. And we talked to um, one um, longtime human rights activist, Ryu and Suk, about this. Um, and, you know, as we, you know, I want to kind of share some insights about our, in, our interview with Ryu and Suk because it shows what Christina Sharp says is absolutely critical when we start to think about these power dynamics in care, which is that thinking is care, Christina Sharp says. And we have to think about how we, how can we think and rethink and rethink care laterally in the register of the intramural in a different relation than that of the violence of the state. And so in other words, how can we think of care not something, not something as always in reaction or response to violence or an oppression, but as a forging of a new kind of social relations that's based on mutuality, uh, interdependence, and a recognition that people are in a shared project for a different world. But to do this, 
we have to go beyond the gendered binaries and hierarchies that have long differentiated roles, responsibilities, and heteropatriarchal value systems in social movement practice. And this is quoting uh, uh, a, a queer activist, uh, Tari Na, and scholar. So as I said, uh, Ryun Suk is one of the Haldonga that uh, Yung Yang uh, Lee has also talked about. She's a former 80s student activist, a founding member of one of the first human rights organizations, Sarangbang, and she's the chair of Chang Human Rights Research Center. But really, what's important about this research group is that um, they really um, were explicitly uh, formed as a voluntary collective, kind of opposite from a lot of these large social movement organizations that Yung Yang Lee talked about. Uh, and what's interesting is that um, they have these study groups, which is very, you know, sort of common in the 1980s. And Dune success, quote, people started calling this space surbang or drinking room as a play on the word kongubang or study room. Um, and, you know, really, she started hosting these elaborate gatherings, these feasts in their office in central Seoul, uh, not too far from the epicenters of protest, uh, as an alternative to the kind of tuipri that always uh, follows a, a lot of protests and uh, meeting events. These are financially burdensome, they don't accommodate vegans and vegetarians, and it's always sort of awkward to split the bill. So just kind of even thinking about this kind of granular aspect. Um, and so we asked, especially one day when we were at um, uh, one of these surpangs because Ryun Suk invited us, you know, as the person who does most of the cooking and cleaning, do you feel like surpang might reproduce some of these unequal gender roles and inequalities? And then there was a long, awkward pause. <laughs> so if you do interviews, you realize, you know, you just wait it out. You know, you try not to fill the space. And Ryun Suk says, I do want to be hospitable as the host. It's not because I'm a woman that I play this role. I simply want to treat my guests well, and I wouldn't want guests to clean things up. I do think it's important for everyone to do this kind of reproductive work, though, so they know how to do it and to do it together in ways that recognize the value of this labor. And then she goes on to bemoan how a lot of 80s uh, male activists, you know, uh, continue not to do this, and she should have fought harder in the 80s. Okay, so my last example, and I'm running out of time, so I'll do this very quickly, is uh, Guljam. It's the first worker-run shelter dedicated to supporting protesting workers engaged in long-term tent encampments in Seoul. So if you look at the design, uh, two leaders from Kiryung Electronics were really led the process of purchasing, designing, literally doing the construction, uh, you know, the interior design and running the programs. And it's a place where uh, workers, especially who travel to the capital uh, to wage these protests uh, that are, uh, uh, you know, come to be long term, can um, bathe, wash their clothes, eat a hot meal and, and get a, quote, honey like sweet sleep. But they're very explicit, no alcohol, and it's self-serving cooking and laundry. And so this is also a reflexive principle uh, that's integrated into the way they designed uh, and operate the space. Uh, Guljam is located in the working class industrial Kudo district. Um, and, um, you know, it also operates as this communal space. And you can kind of see it here with public art. Um, we met up with two KTX uh, leaders uh, uh, a week after the interview at the rooftop of Guljam. And I think what's significant is places like this also, uh, once they are part of the material infrastructure, create another space for people to come together, right? For KTX and Kiryong workers to come together, but also all the people that contributed in the building of this. And the KTX union leaders that we talked to were really excited because they said, quote, they also volunteered their manual labor and solidarity, but mostly in the form of design, not like, you know, the heavy, um, like pipe work and plumbing. And they say because they got so much help for their struggles in the past and they didn't have to deal with the same sleeping on the streets as other workers because of their union and also um, having their tent encampment inside the Seoul uh, Central Station. Um, but they also had this principle of reciprocity where they said, we've seen other people have a really hard time because there wasn't anything like Guljam. So it's great that people now have something they can depend on. Okay, so to conclude, I'd like to conclude by returning to failure. Our ethnographic examination of the role of key activists in building caring infrastructure shows that failure is not simply an event. 
that results in movement decline and collapse, which is the way that most social movement scholars talk about it when they talk about it at all. Failure is a structure that shapes all uneven contests waged by the seemingly powerless against the powerful. And so we recognize failure as context and structure, not as finite outcome shifts. Um, and we really need to actually then rethink what solidarity means and how it's practiced as part of the collective political work of transformation. And there's three kind of final points I wanna leave you with. First, we need to expand our understanding of solidarity so that we don't limit it to simply shared political ideologies and collective identities that demand likeness or similarity. And this is something that women of color, uh, uh, feminist scholars have long talked about. We have to talk about solidarity as spatial in a feminist sense, as relational, as producing space through solidaristic relations as, quote, the simultaneity of stories so far, according to uh, geographer Do Dorian Massey. Solidarity reorganizes everyday life through the life-giving activities of caring as essential support for social and social movement reproduction, as we've, uh, you know, uh, showed uh, uh, in our um, uh, research with uh, especially uh, activists and supporters. And I want to leave you with a quote by Ruth Wilson Gilmore uh, in uh, 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 a video that she did entitled The Geographies of Racial Capitalism, where she says, quote, solidarity is something that is made and remade and remade. It never just is. It's radical dependency. Thank you. All right. Um, thank you very much, Yung Young and Jennifer, for these um, fascinating presentations. I think I'd like to respond with just a few points and basically praise the presentations on two counts. The first is um, for interrogating the tactical choices and the repertoires of collective action in Korea um, and trying to unpack how activists have agency to make choices about what tactics they choose, but how their choices are also shaped by history and culture. Um, as well as uh, these choices are a response to, say, how the states and firms treat them. And the second um, category of comments that I have is I think both presentations really did a nice job in laying bare or exposing um, the infrastructures that enable protest in Korea, which we usually take for granted lumping together as supporters. Um, and I think really unpacking that uh, is a very productive contribution of both presentations. Um, so on the question of how do we explain tactical choices, uh, I think the focus, especially on extreme forms of protest, is welcome. There's a heavy focus in studies of Korean collective action to take a look at large demonstrations like the one pictured behind me. Um, and uh, the sort of one person demonstrations and especially this extreme form that which is different than disruptive or violent protest, I think adds a lot to our discussion. Um, I'd like to push you maybe a little bit to um, think about our, to, to what extent and how can we know if these extreme forms of protest are primarily a reaction to failure. So this um, you use the phrase increasingly desperate measures. Um, because especially uh, not only are the workers ignored by the state or by firms, but the very marginalized workers among workers are also ignored by the unions. Um, so in their desperation to be heard, are they engaging in extreme forms of um, protest because they have no other choice? Or is there also an affective personal reason for this, like a catharsis or a... Um, it helps them sustain their own uh, participation in the movement. At the same time, is it also that the media in South Korea, um, you know, really only covers things that are particularly dramatic. Uh, and so they're trying to give visibility. So this is like, um, you, you use the concept of expressive collective identity, but also expression of catharsis. Um, the other is for the movement itself. And I think this links to the infrastructure part of your presentations, to what extent are these extreme forms of protest actually strategic choices, not just desperation? And I don't know how we can 
uh, answer this question necessarily, but it's just asking you to respond a little bit. Um, so there have been studies about social movements elsewhere where the experience collectively of violence heightens commitment to the cause among people who have shared that experience and helps to sustain participation in the movement. Um, similarly, one of my former colleagues who studied Jewish resistance movements in the Holocaust ghettos found that um, the experience of selective repression by the state rather than indiscriminate repression leads to um, skilled, more skilled resistors. So further down the line, not only do they share this experience with violence, but they build the know-how, the organizational networks and the operational security and the sense of injustice that helps sustain activism over time. Um, and so I wonder if you could speak a little bit about the evidence of how the experience of risk or watching somebody engage in extreme forms of protest or being there with them has affected both the Tang Saja, the people doing the protest and their supporters. And I think this relates to kind of the future rounds of activism or the reproduction of, of movements that both of you talked about. So um, one sociologist called this the abeyance structures. So even if it's not visible protest, the infrastructure is built up over time, whether it's through relationships or through resources or through affective ties and shared identities um, that help make it easier to protest next time. Um, and so this brings me to, I, I think the real strength in your presentations is to unpack these infrastructures that enable protest. Um, and I think Yoon Gyeong, you've done a really great job in your book, for example, on looking at social movements relationship to political parties, um, but also unpacking what these solidarity or umbrella organizations are that are just taken for granted in the Korean collective action context. Um, in social movement scholarship, there's been a focus on the resources needed to protest for a really long time. And I think what both of your presentations do is um, add nuance and complexity that it's not just money and organizations and expertise, for example, of lawyers or of researchers, but there are also these relationships and the emotional ties um, that bind people together that make sustained collective action easier. Um, and I, I think that's a real benefit. Um, there's some scholarship, for example, Patricia Steinhoff on her work on far left um, organizations in Japan uses the phrase doing the defense, defendant's laundry, um, which I think resonates really a lot with this idea of the, the mundane care activities that the supporters do. Um, so she writes about how um, the supporter legal support networks uh, around um, political uh, prisoners like do their laundry, they show up for court, they carry the mail back and forth. In my research, I, I many of the supporters would just drive the activists. They'd be like a chauffeur. And I think bringing out um, a lot of these mundane, or you call them nitty gritty, parts of social activism is, is a great um, contribution. Um, I wonder, in that context, um, we often use the, the term support. And if you could speak a little bit more, Jennifer, about how support differs from care. Um, and I think, uh, again, I don't have any clear answers on this, um, but I, there's, there's a tendency in the support um, context to think about providing money or um, copiers or organizational ties or expertise. Um, and maybe care is a little bit more on the mundane um, caring for the person. In the context of my research on disability um, rights activism, there has been a move away from concepts like care. Um, in part because they are paternalistic or um, deny the rights and the agency and the um, the personhood of the Tang Saja or the uh, disabled persons. And uh, in the mobility rights movement in Korea, for example, the Idongkon Yonde, where they're trying to get more accessible public transportation, 
um, a lot of their um, quite disruptive protests, which you may have experienced in the subways in the last couple of years, uh, really tried to foreground the, the Tang Saja and put in the background, make invisible the, the supporters or the caregivers. At the same time, the disabled right, disability rights movement has also returned to care. Um, and those very same protesters uh, realized that for daily life and for many people, they needed caregivers. Um, and so part of the protest branched out to demand that the, the government in Korea start supporting um, personal attendance for people with disabilities. And so there's been a shift back to care. And I wonder in um, among the protesters that you were interviewing, is there like a reflexivity about the pros and cons of this concept of care? And I think to ask sort of a final question about um, these infrastructures are helping to sustain social movement activism down the road, but what about the next generation? Um, I know, Yung Yung, in your presentation, you talked a little bit about some of the, the older forms of protest. Are young people, for example, participating in the caregiving activities, or is it more of an older generation type of thing? Are, um, are the extreme protests uh, drawing young people into these causes, or are they seen as kind of an old, old, old fogey style activism? All right. Thank you very much. Uh, thank you so much for um, for your careful uh, reading and listening uh, to my um, presentation. Uh, of course, I don't think I can uh, respond to all you know different aspects of it, but um, just just to say a few words about um, how um, workers and uh, labor activists came to choose this kind of uh, extreme repertoires. When I uh, spoke to them. Um, Many of them repeated the same phrase in Korean, which was "아무것도 안할 수가 없어서." So we couldn't just stay idle doing nothing. So, um, so I think the beginning was yes, because the media was turning against them. Um, you know, the government was uh, bec uh, becoming more repressive. So uh, I think they were pushed to do something that was dramatic, that at least. Uh, uh, that would uh, catch the attention of the public, people who are, you know, um, crossing the street or, you know, the, the media attention. So that was, I think, the beginning. And then um, after that, it became uh, more like a set of um, protest repertoires that became more um, natural for them to choose or to rotate or you know okay this time we, we did uh march it didn't work so maybe we need to do something more extreme and then uh you know you choose to do this um occupying high altitude structures or something or they can start from your know, hunger strike and it didn't work and they want to really continue the cause so then they set up this tent and stay in the tent for you know months or years so I think now all these you know, extreme protest repertoires that I talked about became a set of routines that they can uh, exercise sometimes at the same time or sometimes in, in um, rotation. Um, so, um, so I think you know, you know, yes, the media, you know, which uh, which political leader is in in power, all those kind of things uh, really um, matter, and. Uh, when it comes to the question of activist generation, I think this is more of the um, uh, old labor activist um, closeness to more committed extreme um, protest. Uh, and, and there is also another um, aspect of uh, generational, uh, generational division that uh, say more younger labor activists are like organizing around, um, uh, what is that, um, platform worker uh, solidarity. And they, uh, and, and, and you know, one protest that, that I observed is, you know, this, you know, delivery workers, uh, they're just riding their bikes and they're roaming the streets and distributing um, uh, flyers. So I think there is this, you know, generation, generational gap and also, um, Many young activists are more in the feminist movements, in the um, 
uh, uh, climate justice movements, and their tactics are quite different from the ones that I observe from more, I would say, you know, seasoned uh, labor activists uh, that I presented in my talk. Thanks. I think the um, it's really interesting to hear about the disability rights um, activists and um, how they're thinking about support and care. Um, I've done actually a lot of work on home care workers, so the home care workers for uh, uh, disabled um, uh, uh, people. And so it's interesting to think about how that um, relationship and tension works out for like actual social movement um, protesters. And one key difference is that I see support as just encompassing a couple of the aspects of the feminist ethics of care that Joan Tronto talks about. So providing di direct support for, for me, that's sort of caring for, you know, like how you organize and mobilize resources within your own organizations, uh, with the broader public. I see that as sort of one dimension. But I also see support as really focused on the individual person or struggle. So, for example, like, um, you know, resource mobilization is often talking about, you know, like the civil rights movement, which is where that theory came out of. But in a lot of ways, I think the, the shift to care um, redirects our focus to just the broader dynamics of social movement reproduction writ large, not a single uh, individual like Tang Saja or even like a single uh, struggle or campaign. But really, I think in South Korea, you can very much talk about this infrastructure that's developed on many, many different layers. Um, so what I really like about the concept of care, even though like I study care work and also kind of as exploitative and akin to servitude still, so very familiar with these dilemmas. But what I think is interesting is that um, a lot of the theory that we draw upon is actually uh, U.S.-based abolition movements um, and uh, kind of the push for mutual aid in the context of a neoliberal uh, state. And so they're actually redefining care in ways that I think are productive. But even when we had our interview with Ryu and Suk, when she talked about gendered labor, she used the English word, I can never say, K-O, K-O, you know? So she, like she's still operating with these frameworks even though we're using them. And I think that's a dilemma all of us face when we talk about language. I'll just make one kind of brief comment about violence, just because I know it was for Yung Gyang, but I'm going to answer it, um, <laughs> which is that I actually don't think the experience of violence builds commitment. I think in our cases, um, and you know, I think the the the, the classic case would be Sangyong Motors workers. If you look at the workers who died gradually over the years, the union leaders say they were the ones that were not active in the union. The ones who are pretty much abandoned and alone, they either died because of uh, workplace related or, or like kind of protest related injury, or they died by suicide alone. But I think what's important is the experience of being cared for when you have a shared experience of violence and how that actually fosters commitment. Because like the Sangyong Motors workers, you know, they're like, they're considered the quote unquote labor aristocracy, the old fogies. And they developed alliances with queer rights activists, disability rights activists, feminists. And so it's not really, for me, a generational thing. It's about the very purposive and reflexive ways that solidarity is being formed, which I think that case is interestingly one that's producing a kind of a new um, kind of and more diverse um, legacies for social movement practice. Thank you. All right, thank you very much. Uh, we do have about five to 10 minutes uh, for questions. Uh, otherwise, uh, we will save it for uh, the end of the colloquium, but we will. I will take one or two questions if you have any. Yes, Bertrand. I'm an economist by background, and I found your presentation illuminating. Uh, but I was asking myself the question of how the protest relates the channel of success, what is, there are successful outcomes, there are failures, and that uh, expands the discussion way beyond what you presented. But I have a short question in Professor Lee's presentation. There was a diagram that was, I'm an economist, so diagrams automatically catch my attention. And it was showing the evolution of different types of demonstration. And I was struck that 
According to the graph, there was no demonstration activity in 2009. Is there a, a significant background to that outcome or is it just a, a statistical fluke? Um, I got the same question um, when I gave, uh, um, uh, when I presented my paper on uh, labor protests elsewhere. And I'm, I'm still trying to figure out, but I think as, um, the number of uh, newspaper articles that was uh, that were transport uh, transported in uh, NV for the um, uh, analyzing uh, app was small. So it does not mean that there were no protests in that year, but the specific forms that I quoted for that year uh, was not, I think, significant enough in terms of the number. So. Okay. In other words, it was a reporting issue. It was not the right, right, right. Yes. Yeah. So I, I am in the process of expanding the scope of newspaper articles that I will be analyzing in the next round, uh, because not all uh, national and local uh, newspapers were included in my first data set. So yeah, so that was a data issue. I have a question. Oh, yes. My name is Yang Noyun. I'm an economist again. I work for the same institution as work and work. Um, as a person who used to uh, protest a lot during their college days in 1980s, early 1980s, I think that the, uh, um, your really presentations are great, but it's quite uh, a little bit interesting to me as a diaspora um, in the sense that it's a little bit too much uh, theoretical to me because I'm not a feminist, I'm not a sociologist, I'm not, you know, but the, um, what really uh, I think the, the uh, Professor Addington's uh, comment is very important history, but the history should have gone much further. So Korea was that work anymore? Sorry. So uh, Korea was very famous, was notorious in protesting in the 1950s and 1960s. So the times, the time in the London at the time, the Times was the best newspaper. Now it's the fourth newspaper in London or something insignificant. The Times was very, very uh, honored by everybody. Times said that, I don't know whether it's true or not, we learned that in school. Times said that Korea is uh, so notorious for protest, especially by college students. So if uh, the um, you know, Korea, would never be able to be democratic. So if uh, Korea becomes a democracy, you, if you expect Korea to be democratic, you'd better look for the uh, actually rose in the uh, dump of the um, garbage uh, collection place because that would be, but thanks to that uh, protest, we won the uh, democracy. And the, uh, so that's one thing. But on the other hand, I think that what Professor Lee said, oh, you know, why people say, what, when you, in your comments, uh, in your answer, you said, uh, yeah, why do they do this kind of extreme, um, the protest? So that's because we cannot just idle around. It's great. I think that, but it shows that Korea, to me, as an economist, who worked on the many continents in various countries, which didn't have the democracy and the, whose democracy was declining in the West. I've seen mo most of the countries, many countries. To me, the, uh, the, their comment, their answer is that Korea, Korea's democracy is now functioning too well and they don't know how to use democratic, uh, really democracy. And the old timers who used to be just doing the mark, I mean, the protest, they don't adjust themselves to new uh, democratic society. So that's, that's just, they are repeating exactly the same thing they used to do. When we used to do, we need that kind of thing. We need the John Tails, the uh, but not needed. I don't, I am not happy about the John Tail uh, burning himself to death to protest. But, no, like, so I think that you are, uh, so I'd like to ask you, I think that the, uh, my question is, this is my theory that Korea's 
democracy is not functioning. That's why they don't do it. Second, they really are desperate because they cannot, they don't find their role in the new society anymore. Do you think it makes sense? <laughs> Uh, it was very uh, long and complicated question, uh, but um, I, I, I want to respond in this way. Um, democracy is a very uh, elusive uh, concept, and it means many different things in many different places. And um, in the study of democracy, uh, we, 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 we uh, sometimes assume that there is some uh, general logic that makes democracy and that makes uh, democratization possible. And uh, those assumptions are based on very limited experiences of uh, European and North American uh, experiences. And I think there are multiple trajectories that make and make uh, democratic politics. And I think that's something, some kind of story that I want to tell through my study of Korea, Korea and Korean social movements and Korean democracy. Thank you, Yingyo. Uh, this next question is from online. Uh, we have a lot of questions online, but this one goes to Jennifer. Uh, you make interesting points about care. What about online care these days? Maybe I've been thinking about online hate more than care. Um, but um, I mean, I do think, um, you know, I, I can't say I, I, I am not great at thinking about sort of online or digital media activism. I think partly uh, because so many of the struggles that we look at depend on people literally being there as what I call, you know, as what geographer calls protective accompaniment. Um, but certainly not everyone can be there. So I, I don't see sort of a dichotomy or a binary between online and offline solidarity or support practices. Many of the same people who are there are there because of you know um, telegram or social media or other kind of um, digital technologies that enable them to respond kind of quote just in time so for me um, maybe the more interesting thing to think about is how they are actually inextricably interconnected in ways that are um, you know facilitating this um, kind of um, multifaceted care thank you for that um, there's a movie called a taxi driver and the background is the Gwangju uprising. And there, uh, while the citizens of Gwangju are, are protesting, uh, other citizens are providing them with food. They also do uh, medical care for those who are injured. And the taxi drivers at, in Gwangju were the chauffeurs delivering the citizens to and from uh, the protest sites. Uh, Having said that, we so please, as we take our 10 minute break, do not hesitate to eat kimbap. We'll take a 10 minute break. Thank you very much. Mm -hmm.